Morning, everybody. Hope everybody's feeling good. Everybody feeling all right? All right, good, good. Uh, final day of the conference. Uh, I hope everybody had a great day yesterday um, and a fun night. We've got a lot planned for today. Um, uh, ending with tonight's New York State Craft Beer Competition Award Ceremony, which was sponsored by Cold Break and New York Craft Malt. Uh, there's also going to be a reception before uh, the ceremony, which is going to be sponsored by MMB & Co. Uh, Pre-ceremony and after the ceremony, uh, Apostle Jones will be up here on this stage uh, playing live, which is sponsored by BMI and OI. So I hope you all plan to be here. I went to the Ohio conference last month and had the privilege to see Apostle Jones. I'm telling you, it's, it's a huge band, it's a great band, and I hope you all stick around um, to, to see them afterwards. Um, I need to once again thank our conference sponsors who helped make this happen without their support along with your attendance. Again, this would not be possible. The sponsors are super important to us at pulling this off. So we hope you have some good networking and we certainly hope you're visiting all of the folks here in the exhibit hall. We've got a really great morning ahead of us uh, with another incredible keynote speaker, Dr. Bart Watson, who I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but before we get to Bart, I wanna once again recognize our presenting sponsor, Deutsche Beverage Technology. Um, they've been with us uh, for three years uh, as a sponsor and we're super grateful for that and super grateful for Fred Nixon for, for being here and, and supporting us. So thank you, Fred and Deutsche. Um, so now it's time to introduce this morning's keynote. Bart Watson is the chief economist at the Brewers Association, a position he's held since 2013. Prior to his position with the BA, he was a lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley and a visiting assistant professor at the University of Iowa. He holds a BA from Stanford University and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and is a certified Cicerone. And on top of all of that, Bart Watson was recently inducted into the ultimate Frisbee Hall of Fame. So there's that. So I have to, I have to, uh, had to present that. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Bart Watson. Thank you. All right. So I'm here to give my keynote address about uh, forehands and backhands, apparently. Thanks for blowing up my ultimate spot. Um, all right. So um, thanks to Paul. Thanks to the New York State Brewers Association uh, for inviting me. Uh, always an honor to be back in New York. So uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my talk today is going to be called uh, Crafts Changing and Maturing Market. Um, and I want to open with one other thank you, which is a thank you to all the Brewers Association uh, members in the room always say the two most important expenses when you're starting off your brewery are to your state guild, so you should all be members, which you obviously are because you're here, uh, the New York State Brewers Association, uh, but also the Brewers Association, we're there to promote and protect you um, at the federal level, just like uh, Paul and his team are doing a great job at the New York level. So thanks, uh, BA members, the reason I can be here. All right, so um, we're going to start by looking into the past. Um, understanding where we are right now um, requires, I think, more context um, than ever before, because so much has changed. And in those changes, I think of sometimes we lose sight of where we were before we entered the pandemic. So before we jump into the current numbers, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on past numbers, on what we were seeing in the industry in 2019. And for anyone who's ever done any forecasting, you'll understand why this is important. You can't forecast from a single data point. You have to understand the past to see those lines, to understand the context. So to understand where we are now and where we might be going, which I'm going to give a few kind of loose predictions today as well, we're going to go back and hopefully be able then to separate what's going on right now from changes in COVID to slowdowns in the market to what was just a natural progression of where the market was going anyway. All right. So where were we in the before times? For one, brewery growth was already slowing. It was still increasing, but if you look at this curve, you know, it's still going up. This is from 2019, but it wasn't the rocket ship that we had seen in the previous few years where three plus breweries were opening a day. The number I heard for New York was a brewery was opening every eight days here in New York. Um, we were already starting to see a slowdown in 2019 from that rocket ride and, and starting to even out. Here's a slide that I included in my 2019 uh, State of the Industry Address at CBC. 
Sales growth is slowing, changing, fracturing. So that was already going on in 2019, and I think describes a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about in this talk very well as well. It's not new that we were seeing that you know, double-digit growth rate had, had started to go away, and the pockets of growth were becoming smaller and smaller as the big opportunities had you know, largely been, been taken. One of the big challenges we face right now is distributed draft is still very weak. I'm going to show a lot of data, both, both for New York and national, showing that keg sales haven't come back to where they were. This trend had already started pre-COVID. So if you look at this, and it's a little harder to see on this graph, but you know, 2016, 2017 was the peak, and 2018, 2019 had already started to see keg sales go down. Um, total draft sales were going down, and that distributed keg part was going down, partly because tap rooms and brew pubs were doing a successful job at, at growing their draft sales. And then finally, beverage alcohol competition was already starting to heat up. You know, certainly one of the reasons, you know, we're seeing a slowdown in crafts is just people are drinking other stuff, and I'm going to give you some data on that today. But this was already happening pre-COVID, and has only accelerated in the last few years, and, and we'll look at that. So, recapping where we were in 2019, I think it captures a lot of the themes that I'm going to talk about today. The market was already starting to mature. It wasn't that, you know, kind of Wild West rapid growth rate that we had had in, in the previous five years. So a return to trend is going to be back to that. Distributed draft was already weakening, and there was already a lot of competition. And since then, and I'm going to talk about this next, we've had huge shifts in lots of parts of the economy. We've seen increased competition both within brewing. There's still a thousand breweries that have, that have net, you know, increased since 2019, in addition to a lot of growth in, in beverage alcohol competition. All right. So what's happened since 2019? A lot. The first thing to say, and I'll try to give some color where, where appropriate on this throughout the talk, is I'm going to give a lot of national and state numbers, but what really matters to most of you in this room is what's happened at your local level. And I don't have time to go through, you know, city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, but it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of the shifts that I'm talking about have hit different parts of our urban geography differently. So downtowns have not recovered the same way that suburbs have recovered. Some towns are going to have bounced back more than others. Um, you know, there's New York City. This is a, um, data from cell phone traffic. So looking at traffic, how has it returned to, to downtowns? New York City's actually doing pretty well relative to, to a lot of places. That bottom one is San Francisco, 31% of the cell phone traffic that it had pre-COVID. So huge shift in where people are going, mostly due to remote work. Um, so as you're looking at all these numbers, I urge you to contextualize them as much as possible to your location. And remember that that might be very different, right? Some places are going to have seen their nightlife come back. You know, when I do travel state to state and you look at the draft numbers, Florida draft numbers are well above where they were. Florida bounced back early and strongly and has population growth and so is going to have a different experience than you here in New York. And even within New York, different towns are going to have very different experiences. All right, with that context, let's go to some national numbers and kind of look at what we've seen broadly. The first is, during COVID, we saw this huge shift in where we drank beer. So the simplified version of what happened to the beer industry when COVID hit is we drank about the same amount of beer and we drank it in radically different places. We stopped going to bars and restaurants and movie theaters overnight, and we started buying a lot more packaged beer. I think we all remember that kind of crazy week where, for a lot of us, our first run to stock up when we knew we were going to be in quarantine for a week or two was to the, to the store to buy a bunch of beer to make sure our fridge was stocked. And that was true of a lot of Americans. So we saw this huge shift, but what we've seen since then is that's really come back to normal. It's come back to trend. And this isn't beer sales, this is total food and beverage. So total sales across bars and restaurants, which is that blue line that fell off and has come back, and packaged food and beverage stores on the red line, which spiked, but has now come back to trend. And if we look at this in historical context, controlling for inflation, blah, 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 what we see is we're basically back to exactly where we were. So the retail environment nationally has now kind of leveled back to where it was. That said, underneath the surface, it's totally different. So for one, we don't have the same retailers. We had huge turnover in the number of retailers. And for beer, my read is this has been a net loss. The total accounts are down a little bit, so we have fewer retailers selling the same amount of stuff collectively. We have fewer independents. Chain has gained share. 
And underneath these numbers, too, we have a different mix composition of who those retailers are. When you look at this and you dive deeper into this data, you see we've lost uh, casual restaurants, sit-down restaurants, and we've gained fast casual and fast food. Generally, you're going to sell more beer at the former than the latter. So we've seen a shift in, in who's selling that food and beverage, and that's been a net loss for beer. We saw a huge boost in e-commerce during the pandemic. That's largely come back down to trend, but you can see that we're still you know, much higher. And this is, again, this is total um, economy. This is not beverage alcohol. Beverage alcohol would be much lower, but we've seen an acceleration in e-commerce, uh, which is changing lots of parts of the economy. We've seen a huge change in the labor market, which I'm sure is posing challenges for those of you in tap rooms and brew pubs who uh, hospitality focused and require more labor. Um, so this is the job openings rate. You can see how much higher it is. Some of this was going to happen anyway. We have a much smaller cohort entering the labor market right now. Gen Z is much smaller than the millennials, so we were going to see some pressure on entry-level jobs anyway, but the pandemic accelerated this. The supply chain has gone haywire. These are producer price indices, so uh, the prices that producers receive when they sell into the next stage. These are five relatively important ones uh, for beer. Uh, looks like I forgot to add the last month. We've seen malt take another step up in this PPI in the last month. Um, if we went back four or five years, there'd be a lot of continuity in these prices. And then in the last couple of years, everything's gotten harder to get, more expensive, um, or often both. Draft never came back, so I've already talked about this a little bit, but another big shift we saw is that the draft market is radically different than it was. Um, on the left is just kegs, so distributed keg sales. On the right includes premise use, which is a combination of what you sell directly at your brewery plus quarterly filers. Um, not really important, but it's a slightly different measure of the draft market. And you can see that, again, it was already declining as we entered into COVID. Right? So we were already starting to lose draft sales. But even if we account for that, we're still two to two and a half million barrels of draft below where we were. If craft's 30% of that, you've got, let's say, 800,000 barrels that aren't in the craft industry that would be if we were back to where we were in draft, which 800,000 barrels dropped from above would, would help everyone in this room a lot. Um, some signs starting to get into New York data that New York draft is lagging a little bit more. Um, that the draft sales haven't come back. We can't actually see sales um, in New York. I don't have a great way to, to look at draft beer sales collectively in New York, but we can look at production. Um, and here's production for 2019, 2021, and 2022 for New York. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, at least this year, and 21, maybe I think, I'm going to talk about this in a second, I think we saw a late bounce back for New York, so that's where some of that kind of production numbers are, are a little more positive in 21. Um, but 22 hasn't cycled that particularly well, and those draft sales are more below 2019 than we see nationally. Wholesalers have looked to simplify. They've looked to rationalize. Um, this is sales to inventory uh, for, uh, excuse me, flipped around, inventory to sales for beverage alcohol wholesalers. You can't pull out beer specifically in the government data. So as that number goes up, that means wholesalers are selling less relative to the stuff that they have sitting in their warehouse. We are now at a level that is well above where we were in 2019. If you're a wholesaler, that's not an equation that you like. You don't want to be sitting on lots of stuff, particularly in a high interest rate environment. So what are you going to look to do? You're going to look to cut back on what you buy, on your suppliers. You're going to look to simplify. Wholesalers really want to get back Really want to get back, this one doesn't have a laser, so, but that middle circle to that low inventory to sales ratio, selling a lot of stuff relative to what you have in your warehouse, that's like a, a wholesaler's dream. So that's a lot of the pressure that we're seeing on the, on the wholesale tier right now. Finally, craft competition is heated up. The number one reason, we do a consumer survey every year where we talk to you know, 2,000 nationally representative craft drinkers. We ask them a whole bunch of questions. And one of them is, did you drink more or less craft last year? And then we ask follow-up questions. So if you drink less craft, why are you drinking less craft? The number one reason people say they drink less craft, it's not I'm trying to get healthy. It's not that it costs too much. It's I'm drinking more of something else. And I'm sure if we did a survey of the people in this room of what you drank last night, some of you drank something else other than craft beer last night as well. We are our own consumer. So if you look at the, this data, you know, we've seen a jump in this, and you know, 10 to 11%, so about 10% of our consumers every year say, I drink less craft because I'm drinking more of something else. Our competition is the number one reason people leave the category. 
And there's lots of that competition here in New York. So if you look at you know, distillers, for example, this is states uh, with the most distiller permits. New York's number two in the country. So just the same as number of breweries, New York number two, number two in distillers as well. So that competition's coming from all places. All right, so lots of changes in the last few years. Where does that put us right now? Starting nationally, um, this is a, a snapshot of our annual production survey so far. I've got almost 5,000 entries uh, between people who have responded to the survey um, and state data that I'm very confident in that I, I can insert. Um, we're running very slight growth right now, 0.4%. Far cry from you know, where we were a few years ago. Um, and we see a big difference here between distributed breweries, which are actually down slightly if you combine those regionals and micros, and tap rooms and brew pubs that are doing a little bit better. Um, interesting to note that gap between tap rooms and brew pubs. I haven't dug in enough to really know why, but I have kind of three theories on what's going on. First, age. Tap rooms, on average, are about three years younger than brew pubs. Two, location, uh, which probably correlates with age. The tap rooms might just be in, located in areas that are bouncing back a little bit better, uh, doing a little bit better. Um, and three, just business model, complexity, labor challenges. Uh, the average restaurant is open six hours less than it was pre-COVID. That's going to eat into your sales. So staffing, all the challenges that come with running that food service side of hospitality, I think, are putting more pressure on brew pubs right now. Um, my prediction is, when we're all said and done, we have all the numbers, it's going to be more or less a static number nationally in, in 22 to what we saw in 21. All right, now a positive slide. The New York numbers are way better. So, so far I've got 100 uh, responses in from New York, um, and we're running 10, plus 10% 10 um, in our survey for New York producers. With, you know, remember, put in context of your location, your business, a lot of variation. So that's not everybody up 10%, uh, but the overall numbers are good. The one negative reason that I think these numbers might be good is I think New York has bounced back slower, and so we're still seeing some bounce back um, in, in 22 that we saw nationally in a lot of places in 21. You know, Florida was back, well, Florida was back by the end of 2020, uh, but a lot of states came back in 21, and I think New York were kind of seeing a later comeback, and you really see that in the regional numbers where um, they were seeing their draft sales rebound a little bit more in, in 22 than we were seeing a lot of places. So, you know, when you look at the 20 numbers, New York's numbers went down more than national, and when you look at the 21 numbers, they came back up slower than national. So I think that's part of the explanation for, for why New York is doing well. But I don't want to rain on good news. I mean, this is still very, very positive. Um, very similar numbers between production breweries, the taprooms and brew pubs. The taproom brew pub number is actually pretty similar to national. Um, and within that taproom brew pub, I didn't break it out. And I say same split as national. It's actually a bigger gap between New York taprooms and New York brew pubs. Uh, than what we're seeing nationally right now. So New York tap rooms are doing better than national tap rooms, and New York brew pubs are doing worse um, than national brew pubs in a limited number of survey responses we have so far. All right, so let's break down these kind of two main ways of selling beer via distribution and, and at the brewery and, and talk about each a little bit um, piece by piece. So at the brewery continues to be the bright spot nationally. It's where the numbers are still strong, we're still seeing them growing. It's also probably the most important part of the business for the vast majority of people in this room. It's a very different business than the distribution business, which is one reason I think we're seeing different trends. Um, it's hard to scale, so it's never going to be 100% of the beer business. We're not going to see uh, all, all beer flowing through tap rooms and brew pubs. And I do think it's worth, when you're thinking about your business planning, looking at these numbers kind of collectively and asking how long this, can this continue. The good news is New York has a long way to go here. If we look at how much beer is sold at breweries in New York relative to some other leading states, the you know, small ones like Vermont or the bigger ones like Colorado, New York is still selling a lot less beer at the brewery than some of the states where um, this is on the leading edge. So I think there's room to go there. But nationally, I think we're starting to see states, the Colorados, the Oregons, where we're selling about as much beer at breweries as we can sell. You know, that channel can't be 50% of the draft sales. And in some states, it's it is getting to 20, 25% of the draft sales in states. So there is an upper limit there. Luckily, I don't think New York's there. There can also cause conflict with other tiers as this part of the business gets bigger. Um, this is going to be most pronounced in states where liquor licenses are hard to get. So New Jersey costs a million bucks to get a liquor license. Not surprisingly, New Jersey bars are not particularly excited when breweries can come in and have a lot of the same rights as they do. 
Um, good re another good reason to be part of your New York State Brewers Association, because I do think those threats will come over time, um, and your state association will stand ready to defend against people taking your rights away. A few data points just showing that these sales have come back. Um, this is 22 data from um, Arrived. I believe they have a booth right over there if you want to talk to them afterwards that share some aggregated data with me. Um, and their on-site sales um, collectively as a percentage of 2019. Um, in nominal terms, um, we're above where we're in 2019, controlling for inflation a little bit below. But again, on-site sales have bounced back pretty strongly. A um, lot of bars, charts here, and I'll, these slides will be available, so don't feel like you have to scribble anything down. Um, but this is the TTB data, um, premise use, so again, what flows through breweries and quarterly filers uh, by quarter for, for 2021 and 2022. Bounce back very strongly collectively if we divide it by the number of breweries you know, back to where it was, if not above where it was in 2019. So the simplified version of this, if we put this chart into words, at the brewery sales are doing very well and have bounced back and continue to cycle. The New York data is a little bit weaker. Um, the, the 2019 data is certainly collectively stronger for this premise use. And take with a grain of salt, again, you know, this lumps in quarterly filers, so, so this might have you know, some quarterly filer weakness in it. I've also pulled out Q3. The Q3 numbers are really, really good for New York in 2022. They're so good that I worry it's a data error, because um, if I had it up here, it would be like twice as high as any of these bars. Um, so, this data is messy, um, but there's some signs that it's not quite as good in New York as it is nationally. All right, moving on to um, distribution. Um, and I've taken this slide out of some other presentations because we've kind of moved to a, a new normal. I, I, as I've already said, I think New York's still experiencing a little bit more of this comeback from the channel shift um, than what we've seen nationally. Um, but as we interpreted distribution numbers in the last couple of years, you had to do everything through the lens of that huge shift in where we drank beer. So in 2020, everybody's package sales were up. If you were in distribution and your package sales weren't up, you were clearly doing something wrong, and everybody's draft sales were down. And 21, nationally at least, was the flip of that, right? Because that tide started to flow back, and so those package sales came down, and the draft sales started to go back up. That's not really the case, at least nationally anymore. I think we might still be seeing a little bit of that channel shift in New York, but it's worth kind of keeping in mind as we look through any distribution numbers Think about how things are cycling, make sure we're comparing them to kind of data points that we're confident in. Um, when we look at some just kind of aggregated data on New York, um, you know, total spending looks pretty similar to national. Um, this is credit card data from Affinity. Um, New York's actually slightly ahead of, of total spending. This doesn't control for inflation, so this, you know, might be price-based partly. Um, but New York restaurant spending is, is tracking with national back well above where it was. Um, New York grocery spending is actually well above national trends. Um, maybe, again, suggesting that there's still a little bit more residual in that package chain. This could also, again, be a price effect. I haven't delved in enough to see if CPI in New York has run um, stronger than the national. Um, but this data suggests people are spending a little bit more at grocery stores than they are nationally um, here in New York. When we look at craft sales, um, we've seen some small dollar growth versus 2019, so things are increasing, but this is driven almost entirely by price. So I've tried to line up these graphs in, in relative terms, so you can see that the dollar growth that we're seeing is driven by price. If you read the, uh, you know, the, the, beer, you know, the beer trade news, you know, a beer marketer's insights, uh, for example, and a supplier talks about how their dollar sales are doing, you should be suspicious, and you should think, huh, why are they not giving me this in volume terms? Because they probably have increased price a ton, and so they're giving a rosy picture to you of, of how things are doing. Um, when we look at kind of overall then, and we, we compare times, this is craft sales for each quarter um, in, in package sales, in IRI data. Q1 was very much still explained by that channel shift. Things weren't as good as they were last year, because that package sales were still kind of coming out of the system as they moved back into draft, but they were still better than 2019, because we still had some package shift. As we move to the back half of the year, we can't say that anymore, because all the numbers are negative. Package sales are negative relative to 2019. They're negative relative to 2022. So craft is just losing share. Um, here's craft share. Um, both, I've done both BA craft and IRI craft, so including acquired brands, doesn't really make any difference. Um, but either way we look at it, package sales for craft in broad distribution, because IRI again is you know, gonna measure chain stores more heavily and, and bigger brands a little more heavily, um, but our volume share is down nationally versus where it was. 
Um, New York's no different. Um, this is not New York craft specific, I will note. This is all sales in New York, so it's going to include out-of-state breweries. It's quite plausible, given those numbers that we saw earlier, that New York craft is doing better than this. Um, but total craft sales in New York in 2022 were negative, like pretty much every state. So this is not a unique experience to New York. New York's actually in the upper third when we look at how your performance is. You were less crappy than everybody else. So as we sum distribution, it's not a particularly pretty picture. Um, give some context to you know, the distribution panel, if any of you sat in that yesterday, where the advice was stay in self-distribution as long as you can, because um, wide distribution is pretty cutthroat and competitive right now, and not particularly easy to be in. And there aren't a lot of bright spots. Um, you know, we have lower draft share than we did, and it's not cycling particularly well. Scan's weak, so package sales are weak. Um, and, you know, you put this all together and it's going to create more short and medium term pressure. If you're a distributor right now and you see the craft part of your portfolio not doing particularly well and other hot, shiny objects, you know, doing very, very well, you're probably going to lean into those. And so what I think we're going to see for the next year or two is more pressure on distributed craft as distributors and retailers think about that space, look to rationalize, look to find those brands that they think they can still get scale on. Remember, they're sitting on a ton of inventory, so they're looking to simplify. And so we've got another year or two of this. Um, and I could probably update the tents on spring re resets aren't going to be pretty. They weren't pretty. Uh, Kraft lost nationally 5 to 10% of its space, um, mostly to other beverage alcohol categories that are packaging in similar ways to us now. Um, we can put this all together through the... Um, beer Purchasers Index from the MBWA. For those who aren't familiar with this, every month the MBWA asks every wholesaler in the country, are you buying more of this, less of this, or the same amount? If everybody says more, it equals 100. If everybody says less, it's a zero. If the same numbers say more and less, it's a 50. So a 50 is a category that's roughly in balance. Craft used to be in the 90s. Everybody was expanding craft. It was going up, up, up. Now we're in the 20s and 30s. Though the last numbers have been a little bit more positive, so maybe we're moving back. But right now, wholesalers are looking to shrink craft, and that pressure is going to continue for the next couple of years. All right. So where are we going? Uh, what are some predictions for the, for the next couple of years? The first, and I think I've already driven this point home, so I won't belabor it too much, is distributed craft's not going to grow in the near future. Now, that doesn't mean your brand can't grow in distribution. There's plenty of people who are growing in distribution right now. But there's really two ways that I see to grow. One is you do it better and you take share from somebody else, right? You take that tap handle away, you take that shelf space away, you convince a distributor to focus more on your brands than on your competitors. The second, which I hope collectively we can all focus on more, is doing something new, doing something incremental. You open up a new tap that wasn't there. You go to a new place and convince a new consumer to drink craft. You offer a new product that wasn't in the marketplace before. But those are really the two ways we're going to grow craft in this slow growth environment, is either we're going to find new opportunities or we're going to shift the deck chairs around and you're going to take somebody else's. Um, and I have a couple of quotes here from retailers that hopefully drive home the point that, you know, this isn't the craft market that it was a few years ago um, and we need to update our thinking. Prediction number two, um, brewery growth is going to continue slowing. I'm trying to reframe this in as positive a way as possible. I'm an optimist by nature. Hopefully it's coming through at least a little bit through these, some of these gloomy numbers. This is normal. What we've experienced the last decade where thousands and thousands of businesses open and nobody close, that's really weird. When you look at that across industries, like we're, you know, we're a unicorn. This, is, this does not exist. The SBA did a study a couple years back where they looked at the default rates of businesses by category. Brewing had the lowest default rate of any industry that the SBA uh, loan to over a 10-year period. That's weird. You don't beat those odds forever. And so what we're moving into is not a market that's collapsing. People have been asking me about the craft bubble bursting literally since my first day in the job on 2013. The bubble's not bursting. We're just moving into a normal mature market where some businesses open, some businesses close. And until we grow the market again, that's going to be the case. Nobody freaks out about the restaurant bubble bursting because restaurants don't grow a lot in numbers every year. And that's kind of the business, you know, as we move into a particularly more hospitality focus with taproom and brew pubs, you know, businesses, uh, business that we're in now. Um, this is happening in New York too. 
Um, this is just from TTB permits because it was the fastest and easiest for me to pull. Take this with a grain of salt. The TTB has been really bad in recent years at pulling closed permits because thanks to the BA, you don't have to put up a bond anymore. Um, so there's nothing, no money to give back, so you have no incentive when you close to, to give that back. Anyway, these numbers are a little bit inflated, but the trend is pretty clear. Um, the increase year over year has been going down here in New York. Uh, prediction three. Um, and I need one that I, I know I'm going to get right, so I'm turning to demographics and saying that customers will change. Customers always change. And, and what I want to talk about for a minute is how some of those changes might affect your business and, and give you some food for thought about what the changing craft customer might look like in the next couple of years. Um, here's some New York data on projections for what the New York population is going to look like in the next 10 years. Um, and in this context of a state that's as big as New York, you know, put these in... You know, put this in some context, you know, 150,000 people isn't that many in New York, right? So we're not talking about, like, enormous shifts. But if we were to summarize, a lot fewer young people. This is true in a lot of states, a little more pronounced in New York than some. We're going to get a lot of people in their 40s, which I'll talk about in a second. Pretty good for craft. That's a good craft demographic. We're going to lose a lot of people in the 50s and 60s as Gen X, which is a smaller generation, kind of moves, and people do tend to exit New York at this age group. And then uh, we're going to get a lot more people 70 plus. Um, not all of them can move to Florida. Some of them will, will stay here. Um, this is going to have effects on the beverage alcohol market in a variety of ways. Um, but one is via spending. People have pretty predictable spending habits as they age. Um, so people under 25 don't spend that much on beverage alcohol. Doesn't mean they don't drink that much. They just find ways to drink economically. Um, and then we see as people move up in job and income that they tend to spend a little bit more, and more or less that holds fairly steady from your mid-20s to, let's say, your mid-50s, where it starts to drop a little bit, and then somewhere around you know, post-retirement, let's say 75, spending really drops off as health and income start to decline, and so people just tend to spend a lot less on beverage alcohol. If we go back to um, you know, what I just showed you, and you think about this for New York, We've got a lot of people moving into that 35 to 54, you know, that kind of, you know, 40s, which is probably going to be pretty good for craft. That's a period of time where people tend to drink a little bit less, but they continue to move up market in their spending. Um, so they're probably going to drink a little bit less, but maybe drink a little bit better. You know, the worrisome thing for New York is how much those 75 plus numbers were going up, and you see that spending drop. And that's why on that last side, um, if you just run these numbers forward, New York's going to spend about 2% less on beverage alcohol all else being constant um, 10 years from now. Um, I want to also talk for a second about that under 25 generation, because I think it's worth talking about. Um, you can see that this spending has dropped over time. You know, this data's noisy, it's survey data. You know, you want to take it with some grains of salt. But the trend's been pretty consistent, and it's lining up with other data points that we see that suggest that people, young legal drinking age drinkers, are just drinking a little bit less. Um, this is two things correlated. One, underage drinking, which has been going down. Good thing. And the other, the percentage of expenditure, so of their total disposable income, how much do people who are under 25 spend on beverage alcohol? That's been going down pretty consistently and pretty much in line with this underage drinking line. So as people come of age, they're not spending as much on beverage alcohol, or at least they're telling us in surveys they aren't, which those aren't always the same thing, and you know, there might be reasons, right, that people are lying on these surveys a little bit more than they used to, but I think the trend is consistent enough that it has to give us some pause. I think we need to start thinking about, talking about, preparing ourselves for a world in which the next generation just drinks a little bit less. Um, maybe this is cannabis, maybe this is just different um, social phenomenon that the next generation, for whatever reason, you know, maybe because this underage drinking is built into their heads that drinking is bad, um, maybe it's just a delayed effect, right? They're all going to come in, they're going to start working a nine-to-five job, and at the end of the day, a beer is going to start looking really good after a couple of years. So maybe this will go away if we start to look at that, you know, 25 spending, it'll, it'll stay high and people will come back into beverage alcohol. But it's one to think about, particularly, you know, if you're in a college town, this is one maybe you're already starting to see in your business um, as that kind of young legal drinking age drinker doesn't go out quite as much. So to sum this section, I think Kraft has some short-term actual tailwinds. Um, New York's very similar to National, where those millennials, they're aging, they're in their 30s now, they're moving into their 40s, and that's probably a pretty good place for Kraft to be. 
Um, it's people who drink a little bit less, but drink a little bit better. Craft is one of those places that they love. Um, we continue to see that 35 to 44 demographic move up for craft in terms of how much they say they're drinking craft. So that's a good thing. The negatives come from declines in overall beverage alcohol spending as the baby boomers start to exit the beverage alcohol market, which is going to happen pretty sharply over the next 10 years. So if your tap room is filled with a bunch of people who are 65 now, prepare for them not to be there in 10 years. Um, at least on average, a lot of them will be spending a lot less on beverage alcohol. And we also have to start thinking about more and more and more what happens if the next generation just drinks a little bit differently. And side note here, I don't have any slides on this, but there's starting to be more and more research. I think they're also going to think differently about the brands they want to connect with, who they want to you know, associate with. And I think the big challenge for, for this room is they're not as just predisposed naturally to local. It doesn't mean that they don't like local. Um, but that they want to see what local does for them, how you're really connecting to the community. So this inherent millennial belief that local is just automatically good doesn't really translate to Gen Z, and everyone's going to have to work a little bit harder to say, like, oh, this is why being local actually benefits you and our community. All right, um, two more. Growth will be in pockets. I already kind of set this up in the very beginning where I showed that 2019 slide about growth fracturing, changing, slowing. But I think what we're seeing today is that growth is much more targeted to particular occasions, particular types of beers, particular shifts in consumer behavior. And unfortunately, we don't have another IPA or New England IPA where just we can have this broad swath of growth that everybody benefits in. Um, two examples right now of kind of intersections of new stuff, these kind of incremental pockets of growth. Um, one, Convenience and double IPA, growing very, very strongly right now. Limited to few players, but you know, there's actually, it's not just one, there's, there's a number of people who are growing here, and um, it's a good example of a place that Kraft wasn't really before. Convenience is the biggest beer channel, and Kraft has always had tiny, tiny share in convenience, and large format cans and double IPA seem like they've kind of unlocked that, um, and we're actually seeing a lot of growth nationally there right now. Another at the complete other end of the spectrum is non-alcoholic. Pretty small, it's tiny, I don't want to overstate kind of how much growth's there, and a lot of it's being captured right now by one company nationally. But it's a new occasion that matches with some of the consumer trends that I just talked about, and it's growing much, much faster than the total craft category uh, right now, and craft has very high share there. It's, it's very much a flavor game right now. You know, craft is much higher share in um, NA than it is in, in beer overall. So what's next? You know, what are these other pockets? And, if I knew the answer, I would be, you know, spinning up a brand and, you know, uh, capturing that in the market right now. But, you know, some food for thought of, of opportunities, you know, are there more opportunities around lighter styles that we can keep some of that aging population, you know, in the craft drinking category with something lighter, a little bit lower ABV? Um, flavor and fruit are clearly popular right now. Where are they going to go next? Are there ways that we can be kind of authentic to the things that craft does well? and offer consumers kind of new flavor experiences that they want. And, and, you know, in general for this room, you know, what are the intersections of some of the changes that I talked about in the economy and consumers with, you know, New York craft strengths? Um, where can we connect with that? All right, um, final section. Um, the economy is probably going to get worse over the next year, and you probably shouldn't care about it as much as you maybe think you should. All right. Um, so, so why would I say that? First, just kind of setting the basis for the economy. How is the economy doing right now? It's complicated. Um, this is the labor force participation rate in New York and the unemployment rate in New York. The unemployment rate is historically low. Really good. The labor force participation rate is still a point below where it was when we entered COVID. Not so good. Anybody who tells you the economy is incredibly, incredibly strong or incredibly, incredibly weak right now probably has an R or a D attached to their name and is trying to sell you something politically. The answer is it's kind of mixed, it's in between. A lot of stuff's changed and the economy's clearly doing a lot, lot better than it was at the beginning of COVID and there's lots of signs that it's maybe not quite as strong as it was right before the pandemic. The most important economic indicator right now for a lot of macroeconomists is inflation. Um, whatever inflation is, the, the Fed still thinks it's too high. Um, they just raised rates another quarter point, even in the face of, I won't call it a banking crisis because it's not really a banking crisis, but you know, some high profile uh, bank uh, defaults. Um, and the Fed's going to keep cranking rates up, which means growth's going to go down. 
Um, why does that matter to you? Again, I'm going to kind of set up this section is, I don't think it matters as much as you think. Now, again, the caveat here with all of this that I've set up multiple times is local matters. If the plant that is in your town closes, the economy matters to you very, very, very much. But unemployment nationally, unemployment at the state level, doesn't really correlate very strongly with beer sales. So we buy about as much beer during recessions as we do during boom times. Um, if we could control for that kind of late, you know, 2008, 2009 period where beer sales dropped a lot, they didn't drop because the economy was weak, that dropped because ABI and Molson Coors formed and they both jacked up prices collectively. So really, you know, controlling for that, beer sales look about the same in good times and bad. And as we delve into craft, I think we can get more specific here. The craft consumer is not the general American economic consumer. And you can apply this to your business too, right? Your consumer is not the generic craft consumer. I can put up a profile of a general craft consumer, might match with the people in your tap room, might not, based on where you are located, the brand you've cultivated, and who you're reaching out to. What I will say is the craft consumer generally in recent economic downturns has been much more insulated than the average American consumer. And as an example of this, we can look at unemployment by education. Craft drinkers, 55% are college grads and 81% have some college or associate's degree. For college grads during the Great Recession in 2008, unemployment didn't get above 5%. For people with less than a high school diploma, it got above 15%. Those two groups are going to have very different beer drinking experiences during that economic downturn. And craft generally is going to be a little bit more insulated from these downturns than overall. Moving on to inflation, you know, I, I hear a lot from people that, oh, you know, inflation must be causing people to trade down or, you know, a version of, well, I go to the, the store now and, you know, I see a four pack for X dollars and, you know, how can anyone be buying that? We have to remember that inflation itself is not the challenge. Inflation plays itself out through real wages, through how much money people are in their pockets, and wages also go up, right? So there's a certain amount of old man yells at cloud when I hear that price, like, oh, when I was a kid, you know, beer was only X. Okay. All right, well, people make a lot more money now than when you were a kid. When we look at the data, we really don't see that inflation has had much effect on the overall beer market. Craft's not doing particularly well, but hopefully I've given you lots of reasons for why that's true in distribution. And when we look at this descriptive category, when we look at average price point for various beer subcategories, so this has you know, premium and FMB and imports and kind of every subcategory of beer, we look at price point and how they're doing, I don't see any correlation right now between price, and we could look at change in price and it would be very, very similar, um, and, and performance over the past year. Within craft, I think it illustrates this even better, this is from Q3 uh, of last year, higher price craft, not doing any better or worse than lower price craft. You can see generally all parts of craft did pretty crappy in this quarter by volume. And what I think this points to is there's two effects going on. Hopefully I've set this up well in this section. One is that, you know, inflation probably does eat to some level into people's propensity to buy a higher priced beer. At the same time, people who buy higher priced beer are different than people who buy lower price beer, and they're gonna be more insulated from those price changes. So we have two effects. One that means people who are insulated from these price changes that's offsetting the one that says, well, maybe the higher price point if it goes up 10% makes people less likely to buy. And through, to kind of close this section, where I wanna refocus everyone in this room is around the things you can control. You cannot control what the Fed is gonna do at their next meeting. I wish we all had the bat phone and we could call up, you know, Chairman Powell and say like, hey, Chairman Powell, it'd be really nice if you lowered rates a quarter point as opposed to raise them the next one, but nobody in this room is getting that done. What you can control is all the things that relate to your brands. And, you know, to give an example here, when I run models, I've been running, you know, lots of detailed models trying to delve in, you know, what's the cross price elasticity of, you know, craft and other categories. What do, you know, what, what, what are the price elasticities of, of craft brands? You know, throwing everything I can into the blender, how much prices have changed, where it's sold, what format it's in. I've come up with models where I can explain about 4% of brand performance. That means 96%? I have no clue why one brand is doing better and another is doing worse. And that 
is what the people in this room control. You control how people perceive your brand, how strong it is, how if you take price up a dollar, how willing your customers are to go up that dollar with you because they see value there. They see what you're doing for your community. They see that this one's worth a dollar more than the brand down the street. And there's gonna be a lot of talk about the economy, about changes in the economy over the next year. Not only do I not think that matters that much for your brands, you can't control any of that. What you can control are all the other things related to your brand strength that mean when inflation goes up and people maybe do have a little bit less money in their pocket, they're still willing to spend that money on your brands. And all of the data shows me that that stuff is gonna be far, far more important for you and you can control it relative to the economic stuff. All right, to close with those predictions once more so you have them in one place, distributed growth is gonna to be tough in the next year. Uh, the New York numbers are pretty good, so re-inject some positivity at the end here. Um, the you know, New York distribution seemed like it did well in 22. I'll personally be dubious if we see that again in 23. It's a tough environment out there and we should all acknowledge it and be prepared for it. Brewery numbers are moving towards static and that's okay. The sky is not falling. Welcome to a normal competitive business industry. Demographics are gonna change and there's challenges and opportunities there. Um, and I'd urge you too to pull those demographic numbers. This is a great, you needed a, something to talk about with your board at your next board meeting. Pull those numbers for your county. Good food for thought as you think about kind of long-term business planning. Um, uh, Cornell has those, all those demographic projections by county in New York. So pull those, think about what it means for your business you know, 10 years from now. Growth is there, there's still growth out there, but it needs to be focused. What's the incremental opportunity that th is there for your business? If you're in distribution, how are you filling a niche in your distributor's portfolio that's gonna allow both of you to grow? Because if you're just another hazy IPA that's pulling from something else in their por portfolio, they're gonna care a lot less than if, hey, here's a new place where we're both gonna get growth and this is gonna add cases to your truck every week. So where are the incremental opportunities that we can find growth and grow the category? And the economy may sour in the next year. Interest rates are probably gonna still go up. If the Fed is raising rates, even when banks are failing, they're gonna raise rates again and again. But you should ignore those headlines, control the things you can control, focus on your brands, and think about your customers. Um, so with that, I'll close, say thank you, and I think we got time for some questions, if anybody has any questions. Anybody? No. You can ask me afterwards too. Yes. Yeah, questions about states and marijuana. Um, the, the short answer is there hasn't been an impact nationally or in states. If you look at uh, beer trends, beer trends in the last few years have been strongest in legalized states, controlling for lots of other stuff. So, so far we have not seen legal cannabis be an issue. I, I think, again, this is a good example of offsetting effects. W will legal cannabis eat into occasions? Maybe. But in legalized states, the price drops so much that existing cannabis consumers have more money in their pocket, some of which they may be spending on alcohol. And there's been a couple of studies that have suggested this, that you know, legal cannabis consumers are actually, or people who were illegal consumers who are now legal consumers are actually leading to some increases in alcohol spending. I would differentiate that kind of short-term answer from some of the things that I said longer term. I do think what we're seeing, starting to see evidence of, is the next generation, they perceive alcohol a little bit more negatively and cannabis a little bit more positively. And so that this equation may shift over time as we get kind of new legal drinking age drinkers. But the short term answer is legal states haven't seen any, and you know, I've delved pretty deep into this. We got some county by county data in Colorado and we looked at county taxes and, and beer shipments by county and zero effect. So short term, I don't think it's something that, that has really moved the numbers that much. Long term, it's, it's an occasion and, and dollar threat. You know, people only have so much money and, and there's clearly some overlap in those occasions for some consumers. Yeah. Should uh, brewers consider fermenting apple juice and selling ciders? Should brewers consider fermenting apple juice and selling ciders? Yes. Should everyone? No. I mean, you know, this is one of those kind of, you know, it's gonna, you know, it's a different business focus, right? It's something different. Is that something that 
you know, resonates with your existing consumers, is incremental to, you know, what you're doing, and is the worth, you know, the, the incremental revenue you get there worth the, the split in focus? I mean, the kind of question that's like very hard to like answer collectively, but you know, there's gonna be individual businesses, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And you know, I'll, I'll say two words about the cider business. Cider has been down for, I don't know how many years now, five, 10, but that's really at the top level. And if you delve below the top brands, the Angry Orchards and you know, kind of nationally distributed ones, regional cider's been doing pretty well. The regional cider numbers are pretty strong. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of overlap in general between that kind of that customer and the craft customer, you know, kind of what they're interested in, their, their cues, how you market to them. So um, it's not gonna make sense for everyone. You know, you make German lager beers, you know, moving into you know, dry hop ciders or something like is gonna probably confuse your customers more than it's gonna help you. But there's gonna be lots of business that, you know, I mean, a lot of farm breweries in New York where I think cider probably fits pretty well with, you know, the brand you have built and cultivated. So it's an individual business question, but there's certainly opportunities. And we see a lot of companies moving to become broader beverage companies at the moment. Yeah. Is high noon affecting us more or uh, vodka more? Um, I think High Noon is eating into, well, right now it's eating into, you know, Truly and uh, White Claw. Um, and I think those pulled mostly from, I mean, they pulled from a lot of places, but I think that a lot of them pulled for light beer. I'll say, it, I'll give a different answer for canned, you know, canned liquor generally. I think those are going to eat from us. Um, you know, more so in states where, because this varies by where you can carry those, you know, in states where those sh share shelves, they're eating into our shelf space. And, and I think they're eating, you know, the kind of more, moving beyond just kind of vodka seltzer, which is, I think, again, kind of more light beer refreshment play into kind of more complex, you know, canned cocktails. You look at how they're marketing themselves, it's exactly like Kraft was a few years ago. It's, you know, interesting flavor, it's variety, it's, you know, they're using kind of crafted type language. Um, they're following our playbook. They're still pretty small, but they're growing rapidly, and I do think they're gonna eat into uh, beer shelf space, distributor attention, retailer attention. So, high noon, I don't, I don't think is, in particular competitive threat, that's more kind of light beer and, you know, people who are maybe going to buy a vodka, you know, vodka soda anyway. Um, canned cocktails generally, I do think, is a competitive threat. There was another hand here, yeah. yeah can you share anything else about, my question is, you mentioned losing market share on the shelf in stores. Can you talk a little bit more about who moved? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I don't think there's one answer. Um, but things that come in a can, are similar ABV to us, and are being marketed in very similar ways that Kraft was, around, you know, flavor, variety, interesting ingredients. Um, you know, so this is canned cocktails, but it's, you know, a lot of these, you know, death by a thousand cuts, you know, hard kombuchas, FMBs that are better for you, um, or better for you, I'm, you know, put that in quotes, you know, that's how they're being marketed with, you know, special botanicals or whatnot. Um, you know, I, I think we see, you know, particularly with the next generation of legal drinking age customer, they're pretty agnostic to what the alcohol is in there. They want flavor and variety. And that was a space that Kraft really owned within beverage alcohol for a long time, right? You had, you know, especially in kind of a convenience at a can, you know, you had light beer, which was about refreshment, and wine and spirits were off kind of doing their own thing. And, and we had this flavor variety in a to-go package kind of cornered. And that's not true anymore. There's a lot of things that are trying to do that. And I think it's collectively kind of that set of things, you know, some of them are taxes wine, some of them are taxes spirits, um, you know, some of them are taxes beer, and, you know, they're kind of coming for, for that craft space. And when craft's not backing it up with the numbers, the retailers are going to try out some of that stuff and, and see what sticks. All right. Well, if you were afraid to ask your question in front of a room of your peers, I will be up here afterwards. Um, and thanks again for having me. Have a great show. Uh, thank you, Bart, so much um, for uh, oh, you have the clicker. Oh, here it is. Uh, for being here, Bart is in high demand. Uh, we really uh, were happy to have him. Uh, he was at the Ohio conference last month, the New England conference a few days ago. I mean, uh, New England conference a few weeks ago, and and he did the California conference earlier this week. So we're super happy to have Bart here. I do want to add one thing about the Brewers Association. If you're not a member, you need to be a member of the Brewers Association. Uh, you can thank uh, your federal excise taxes being cut in half 
to the uh, uh, Brewers Association. Uh, I currently serve on the Government Affairs Committee and the Guild Subcommittee, Fred Matt, is on the BA Board. Um, so please, uh, 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 please uh, join the Brewers Association and support the Brewers Association. And thank you, Bart, for being here. Uh, thank you, Lyndon Meyer, uh, Lyndon Meyer Monroe, for sponsoring the two great keynotes. Um, and I think, what was that? And then one other quick note, uh, I was asked to uh, tell you all um, to kind of go with the sustainability theme. If you go downstairs at registration and donate $1, um, there's a tree down there. Well, we'll plant trees to ease your carbon footprint uh, on the conference here, uh, and that's sponsored by Amherst Label. Here is your schedule for the day. Uh, it's gonna be a jam-packed day ending with the uh, ceremony tonight for the award ceremony. So uh, please visit all of the great uh, exhibitors and vendors that are here, and I hope you all have a really great day.